Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life series. This is the second session in a total of nine weeks that we have together. We meet each Wednesday at this time with exception to the final session, which will be held on Tuesday, June the 30th. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a proud UM alumna and will be the moderator for this series. We have over 650 alumni who registered for today's session from around the world. Thank you for joining us and for making this event part of your day and in general choosing to stay connected with your alma mater in this way. This program has tra traditionally been in person geared towards many of our Winnipeg based alumni, uh, but because of current circumstances, we are delighted that we're able to offer this as a virtual experience to all of our 145,000 alumni living in 140 countries around the world to participate. So welcome everyone. We've also been able to offer this program free of charge to all alumni and friends, thanks to the generous sponsorship of one of the University of Manitoba's affinity partners, IA Financial. Many thanks to them. Learning for Life is a very important role for the University of Manitoba, and we're so proud that we're able to showcase so many of our leading professors and researchers in this way. Now, just a few housekeeping details before I introduce today's speaker. You are viewing this webinar on a YouTube link uh, that you will see both the presentation as well as the speaker deliver her presentation. This session is being recorded and will be posted to our website for later viewing. We've also sent you a link to a website called Slido. So it's www.sli.do with the password X065. And the reason for that website is because that is how we're going to be taking questions. And so you're able to enter your question throughout the presentation as well as afterwards. And after the presentation is done, I will be asking your questions uh, to our speaker, and we will try to get through as many as we possibly can, but we may not be able to get to all questions. Uh, but what we will do is send all the remaining questions to our speaker, and she will be able to answer them, and we will share those with you at a later date. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Linda Belneves. She is an associate professor at our College of Nursing, she is the lead. She is a leader in the fields of psychosocial oncology, shared treatment and decision making, and complementary and integrative healthcare. She is also the recipient of numerous nursing awards, including from the Canadian Association of Nurses, and she is also a three-time University of Manitoba grad. So, with that, Dr. Balnees. Thank you so much, and hello everyone, wherever you are in the world. It's a real pleasure uh, to be speaking to you today. I was hoping it was going to be in person, but uh, virtually, hopefully we've reached more of you. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is Linda. Um, I have come back to the U of M after being at UBC and U of Toronto for several years, and it's so wonderful to be back home. So today we're really um, going to be focusing on one aspect of my research program, which for the last eight to 10 years has focused on how Canadians have been accessing cannabis, how the health policies around cannabis has impacted Canadians. And more recently, I've been focusing on the role of cannabis in people living with cancer, as well as I'm just moving into looking at the role of cannabis in long-term care facilities. Uh, so I'm happy uh, to present some of this work today and comment on the larger body of evidence around cannabis in seniors. Uh, and I'm looking forward to any questions that you may have at the end. Just a little note that uh, I'm not able to address any personal health questions related to whether you should use cannabis or not, or what type of cannabis you should be using. Those are discussions that are much better uh, with your healthcare team that actually knows your full uh, health history. So let's dive into it. Um, just a full disclosure, uh, one of the other hats that I wear is being the Deputy Director of the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, uh, which is a nonprofit organization in Canada that is really focused on promoting research in Canada related to cannabis and cannabinoids and, and making sure that there's good education for the general public as well as for our healthcare professionals. And as a bit of a joke, uh, full disclosure for all virtual webinars, I am wearing pants today for this presentation. So I just would like you to reflect a little bit about what kind of things come to mind when you think about cannabis, 
It's also been called marijuana as well. And, and I just wanted you to reflect a little bit on the history of this plant and this product uh, and where we are today in Canada. You know, it, for some of you, especially if you're a bit older, you might remember some of the reefer madness and some of the propaganda films that actually existed around cannabis. It was very much uh, pushed forward by the US government, a little bit by the Canadian government, as really being a, a substance of harm, uh, that it would be very detrimental to Canadians to be using this substance, and that it would be detrimental to our society. And, and a lot of this came out of uh, prohibition uh, legislation that came through in the 1940s and 50s in North America. More recently, we often think about cannabis and we associate it with 420, April 20th, where we would often see many young adults uh, showing up at our legislatures and having a smoke in where they would consume large amounts of cannabis. And this was really happening when people were pushing the agenda of us legalizing cannabis uh, for recreational use. We've also seen cannabis being quite prompt, predominant in Hollywood, uh, in the music scene, uh, and we've often associated with it with recreational use. But I'd like to encourage you to also think a little bit about cannabis, and we're seeing more and more people associate cannabis in this realm as being a potential medicine, being something that people will use as part of their healthcare plan. Uh, and, and for some of us, we also want to really ground our conversations and, and discussions around cannabis is recognizing that this is a plant uh, that is naturally available uh, and has a great deal of potential for us to really research and explore. Um, and I'll dive a little bit more in terms of the complexity of this plant. I also think it's useful to kind of reflect on just, you know, where we've been in terms of the history of cannabis in Canada. You know, if you look back to the 1800s, it was very much seen as being an agricultural crop where we had the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada actually um, giving, you know, farmers hemp seeds uh, as a way of growing a crop that would have uh, agricultural value for things like paper, for rope and for clothing. However, in the early 1900s, especially when we saw um, opium and, and heroin kind of really move its way into North America, uh, we saw it being added uh, to those controlled substances. And so it was really shifted in the early 1900s of being a plant of, of value to something that could be a plant of harm. Uh, and as you move through the 1920s, the 30s and the 40s, you really see it being embedded in our legislature and our, our legislation uh, that this is a dangerous substance. However, it wasn't really until the 1960s and 70s that we actually saw law enforcement paying attention to those, those rules and regulations and actually enforcing it through arrests and, and seizures. And, and really it was not until like the 1970s where we saw the Ladane Commission where people actually started questioning of uh, about these 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 rules and these laws and whether cannabis was that dangerous was actually arresting people placing some individuals in jail related to cannabis possession, was that really worth it? Was that actually causing more harm in our society? And despite the findings of the Ladane Commission, we still saw cannabis being secured within the Controlled Drugs and Substance Act. And it wasn't until the 2000s where we really saw many legal cases come forward and court injunctions that it really kind of pushed the Canadian government and the larger Canadian society to reflect on where cannabis was being positioned with other controlled substances and whether that was appropriate or not. And so if you look more closely uh, in the last 20 years, Canada was one of the first countries in the world that actually uh, developed a medical cannabis program. And again, that was through many court cases where people were saying that to access a medicine that I found of value, I was having to put my, my liberty at risk. Uh, I was, you know, potentially going to be charged and arrested for using something that I was finding was helping me with a specific health condition. And over the next few years, we saw various iterations uh, of those uh, medical cannabis programs. In 2013, we saw the MMPR. What happened then is that we really saw a need to develop more licensed producers so that people had better access to a regulated controlled supply versus trying to grow it at home. Um, however, in 2016, uh, what they realized is that there wasn't a sufficient number of licensed producers available. 
and that for those individuals that wanted and preferred to grow their product at home, that should be legally available. Uh, and then in 2018, as many of you probably know, Canada became only the second country in the world after Uruguay that actually legalized not only medical cannabis, but actually legalized uh, recreational cannabis or non-medical cannabis. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those uh, regulations a little bit later on, just so that people that are in Canada, in Manitoba, are really aware of what the rules are around that. So today's uh, webinar is really focused on facts and fiction. So I thought I would just throw out some of the comments that I've had over the last 10 years around cannabis and just some of the, the facts and some of the fictions that are out there. Uh, and just reflecting a little bit on who uses cannabis in Canada and, and why cannabis is such a popular substance. And I know I've heard a lot of people tell me, you know, it's only teenagers that are using it or everyone's using it. Um, cannabis is only for about you know, getting high, it's not for any other purpose. Um, and I've also had a lot of health professionals tell me, you know, it's ridiculous. Every time I turn around, someone's telling me cannabis is gonna cure another health condition. Uh, there's no way it can have so many health effects. So I'm gonna reflect a little bit on cannabis and our endocannabinoid system to try to address some of those, uh, those beliefs. So just a little bit of a reflection on, you know, cannabis and what's happening here in Canada. When you look at recreational or non-medical cannabis use, about a quarter of our population is reporting using cannabis at some point in the past year. And I think it's important to recognize that that could include just taking one puff on a cannabis cigarette uh, to someone that's using it on a daily basis for medical purposes. So that covers a broad range of different types of cannabis use. Not surprisingly, the most um, prevalent rates of using cannabis is within the younger population. So those that are between 16 and 24 years of age. Since we've legalized cannabis, what's been really fascinating is that we haven't seen any significant shift in the use of cannabis among adults. The only group, however, that we've seen an increase in use has been in those 65 years and over. Uh, we've gone from about three to 4% uh, about three or four years ago to now up to 7%. And for many of us that are doing research in this community, our sense is that because it's legalized, older adults are more comfortable in using it. And in some ways it's legitimized it among groups that may have been hesitant to, uh, to try it. Uh, and in terms of just, you know, how often people are using it, about 20% of our population report that they are using cannabis uh, on a daily basis. And if you're looking at that from a recreational perspective, that's where we have the greatest concern of where people could become dependent uh, on that substance if they're using it that frequently. Uh, however, that also encompasses people that are using it for medical purposes, which they're maybe using it in less amounts and not using it for the purposes of getting high. And so we really need to unpack those figures when we're trying to make any policies and any public health interventions uh, related to cannabis. So I just want to flip us to also think about those that are using it for therapeutic purposes. Um, and we don't have a structured independent program anymore related to medical cannabis. It's been embedded with the recreational cannabis legislation and policies. Uh, but back in September 2019, when we last did a survey, we had over 370,000 Canadians that were officially registered with Health Canada as being authorized to use medical cannabis. Uh, however, when we do national surveys of Canadians, we estimate that it's closer to a million Canadians are framing their cannabis use as being therapeutic. And I think what that really points out is that many people are accessing cannabis either through the recreational market or they're seeking it from illegal sources in order to address their medical concerns. Uh, and that always raises a little bit of alarm bells for myself as a nurse that people are not necessarily getting um, advice from their healthcare team about using cannabis, nor is it being reflected in the consultations they're having and decisions being made around other treatments, including pharmaceuticals. So it's, it's always important that if you're interested in using medical cannabis, that you're trying to have a conversation with your health key, healthcare team about that in order for there to be safe decisions made. Um, but I think it also um, points out this gap in, in use um, is that many people struggle 
uh, to gain access actually uh, to medical cannabis through their health professional. And I've done several studies across Canada that have indicated that many Canadians still experience barriers to getting the official authorization uh, from their doctor, from their nurse practitioner, uh, usually because many health professionals feel they don't have sufficient knowledge uh, in order to make those recommendations. They don't feel comfortable following a patient that's using cannabis, uh, or they feel that the evidence is not sufficient in order to recommend cannabis. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about where we are at in terms of that level of evidence uh, that is available around using cannabis for therapeutic purposes. But what we currently know is that for most people that are using it in that context, they're using it to manage pain, chronic pain, neuropathic pain, or they're actually using it for mental health issues, particularly anxiety and depression. I'm just gonna back up a little bit and talk a little bit about what is cannabis itself. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, it is a plant that's been used for many years. Some of our earliest records of cannabis being mentioned have been from the Egyptians within traditional Chinese medicine, and that's going back thousands of years. Um, you know, more recently, we've really framed this as being a drug that's used to get high or to have some type of a psychoactive effect. Uh, I've mentioned it being used as a medicine, but what we sometimes forget is that for some uh, groups, uh, particularly the Rastafarians, uh, it's actually part of their spiritual services. Uh, and so I think it's important that when we talk about cannabis that we're thinking about it within all these contexts. Cannabis is an incredibly complex plant, and I think it becomes more complex the more we study it. Uh, to date, we know about 110 active ingredients called cannabinoids. Uh, there's only one or two that we've done most of our research on, so there's a lot of space to do more exploration about what these cannabinoids do in the human body uh, and what are their negative as well as positive effects. As a plant, it also has other substances in it. One of them is called the terpenes. And for those of you that know that characteristic kind of skunky smell that's often associated with cannabis, that's coming from the terpenes. And those are things like limonene, pinene, myrcene. And we know from other plant research that these can all have an effect on the human body. For example, limonene is thought to be energizing and to promote things like memory. We also have antioxidants within cannabis called flavonoids. We haven't done a lot of research on them and don't fully understand how they may synergistically act with the other components of cannabis uh, and whether they may have health effects. So just diving into some of the cannabinoids that are most popular, and I'm sure most of you have heard of these. The first one is obviously THC, uh, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's the most well-known of all the cannabinoids, uh, and it is what's been the focus of most of the recreational cannabis because it does have a psychoactive effect or makes people feel high. So feeling a lot of euphoria, feeling happy, um, often your senses will be enhanced because of using uh, THC. Now, cannabidiol or CBD is one that's really gotten a lot of attention in, in the last few years. It doesn't have the same psychoactive effect. It doesn't get you high, but it does have an impact on people's feelings and their cognitions. Often people will say that they feel less anxious in using CBD. Uh, they may feel less, uh, more relaxed in using it, but it doesn't have the same type of high um, implications in terms of impacting your memory or your coordination. Um, what's interesting about CBD is that we're really trying to uh, just start to unpack what the impact is on the human body. Uh, I've had colleagues call it a very dirty uh, drug in the sense that it doesn't seem to nicely fit into any of the cannabinoid receptors in our body. And so there's a lot of research going on right now trying to understand how CBD interacts in our body and what the health effects are. Now, other therapies that you should just be, or other components and cannabinoids you should be aware of, one of them is CBN, uh, cannabinol. We've done very few studies on this, but there is some thought it may have a role around sleep management. Other ones that you may be interested in or starting to hear about, one is THCA, uh, tetrahydro 
uh, cannabinolic acid. It's a non-psychotropic uh, cannabinoid, so it doesn't get you high. It's often found in raw forms of cannabis. So if people decide to you know, blend up their cannabis into a juice, it will have a lot of THCA in it. Uh, it's actually converted through heating uh, into THC. So that's why we often you know, smoke cannabis or we burn cannabis in order to convert the THCA uh, into THC. Now, THCV is an interesting one. Um, it does have some psychotropic effects, so it does create people feeling high, but it has to be often used in very large quantities for that to happen. It's not as powerful as THC. There's growing attention, most of it right now has been in mouse models, around whether THCV may have a role in appetite suppression and making people feel full sooner. So obviously with our obesity crisis in, in North America, there's growing attention to whether THCV may have a role. Now what's really fascinating about all these cannabinoids is that there's a growing belief uh, in the literature, although there's still a lot of debate around it, is that there may be an entourage effect. So it may be that these cannabinoids all work together uh, in a synergistic way to have unique health effects. And if that is the case, it, it really raises some questions about how we do research on cannabis. A lot of the studies that have been done in humans or in mouse models have focused on one specific component, one specific cannabinoid, one specific drug that has been derived from one cannabinoid. Uh, and if there is a synergistic effect, it's gonna be really important that we start doing research that's based on the whole plant. And I know from working with some of my clinicians um, that work with people using cannabis, that their clients often tell them that using whole plant cannabis has a very different effect than if you're using something like Nabilone, which is pure THC. So I think this is an area where it's going to be a lot of interesting study in the coming years. And I already mentioned the endocannabinoid system, and I just want to touch on this very briefly. You know, I'm not a physiologist, um, but you know, we have endocannabinoid receptors throughout our whole body. They're actually the most widely distributed of all receptors in our body. It's, there's a lot of different receptors, but the ones that are most predominant are CB1 and CB2. CB1 is primarily, it's the light blue one. It's in your brain, it's in your central nervous system, it's in our bones, it's in our joints. And so it's not surprising that THC is the one that really locks into CB1. And that's why we have that high that comes from using cannabis that's high in THC. CB2 is interesting because it seems to be much more located within our immune system, in our GI, our stomach, our, our intestinal tract. Uh, and also in our peripheral nervous system. And again, we're still trying to understand how THC and CBD fit into CB2. What's really interesting about the endocannabinoid system, one is that it was only discovered in the 1960s and 70s. So we're still trying to understand the system. Many of our medical and nursing programs don't include it in their curriculum yet. So it's not surprising that many uh, health professionals kind of struggle to understand it. But what's really fascinating about the endocannabinoid system is it's almost a, a system of homeostasis. So trying to balance out reactions in our body. And that includes such things as appetite, sleep, mood, our immune function, our memory and our learning. And as we do more and more research on the system, the more effects that we're really starting to understand. So when a health professional tells, tells me there's no way it could have all these effects, I like to show them this photo because it, it literally shows that we have this system all through our body. So it's not surprising that it may have more than one type of, of health effect on the body. So now I just want to kind of move on a little bit in terms of just talking about some of the cannabis side effects. And I think when you use any substance, it's really important to understand that it could have an impact uh, on our bodies, on our well-being. Uh, and I've done research in the past on complementary and integrative medicine, and I often get you know, people saying to me, well, if it's a natural plant or product, it's, it must be safe, it must be non-toxic. Uh, and like anything you consume into your body, there can be toxic effects attached to cannabis. So it's not a benign substance. You know, often people say, well, only thing it can do is get you really high. Um, and I'm gonna dive into some of the more, more of the side effects that cannabis could potentially have. I also get the, the question a lot that like, can you die from cannabis or, or you can't die from cannabis. Uh, and 
just to answer that one right off the bat, uh, we don't have any instances of people dying directly from the consumption of cannabis. Uh, you would have to actually consume. I saw one person did a Bayesian uh, analysis looking at modeling of cannabis use from smoking, and he indicated that you would have to have a whole trunk full uh, of, of cannabis to actually get to the point where uh, you had negative health effects to the point that you may die. The, unfortunately, the deaths that we've seen attached to cannabis have often because of people using very high concentrations of THC. So doing something like a wax or a shatter, which is 90% THC, they consume that, they have a psychotic episode, uh, and they make very poor decisions where they either hurt themselves or they hurt other people. Uh, and those to date are the only deaths that have been uh, truly associated uh, with consuming cannabis. We have had some instances of young, young children consuming large amounts of cannabis and have had, uh, you know, severe hospitalizations, including comas. Um, but we've had very few deaths that have been attached uh, to those types of things. And the main reason is that unlike opioids, cannabis does not directly affect your brainstem to the point that it impacts whether you're able to breathe or not. So I'm going to jump into a few more of the health effects, some that may be well known and some that may not. The one that I often have heard and a lot of people don't seem to be aware of is the potential impact on your heart. Um, it does increase your heart rate when it's first consumed. It also can lower your blood pressure. And we have seen not only in older individuals, but also in younger individuals, uh, case studies where people have had heart attacks and strokes. Uh, and so it is recommended that if you do have any type of heart condition, uh, that it's important that you consult someone before consuming cannabis. We also, also know that if you smoke cannabis, if you're using a cannabis cigarette, uh, that it can have a negative impact on your lungs. It can uh, worsen asthma, obviously bronchitis. If you're using product that has any type of fungal uh, material attached to it, we often see that in illegal uh, sources of cannabis. It can increase the risk of lung infection and it can worsen cough. There has been a, a large research team over the past 20 years that's tried to show the link between smoking cannabis and lung cancer. They've not been able to find any link. There is a potential that some components of cannabis may actually kill cancer cells. And also we smoke cannabis differently than tobacco. And so there hasn't been a clear link. The only link to any types of cancer and, and, and smoking cannabis has been related to germline cell cancer, so things like testicular cancer. And that's the only link we found uh, to date. I also wanted to make a, a little note around nausea and vomiting. And I think a lot of people think about using cannabis is something that you use when you have chemotherapy, or let's say you're on an antiretroviral for HIV AIDS, and that it helps with nausea and vomiting. And there is pretty good research to suggest that it can help and augment uh, other antiemetics you may be using. However, if you use large amounts of CBD, we have started to see case studies where people end up uh, with, with stomach upset as well as nausea and vomiting. We also have a syndrome called hyperemesis syndrome, uh, which can happen when people chronically use high doses of THC and people end up with the cyclical vomiting where they really can't stop uh, and they often have to go to the emergency room to get it addressed. And for some reason, we find a hot shower uh, seems to stop the vomiting. Um, but again, this is usually in people that are using it in high amounts and using it every day. Uh, obviously, uh, THC using cannabis uh, can make you feel kind of tired and relaxed and sleepy. Uh, and we've seen this both with high THC strains as well as high CBD strains. So that's important to know if you're going to work, if you plan on doing something like operating machinery or driving a car. It's always important if you're consuming any substance, natural health product or cannabis, that you think about your other medications that you may be using. Both THC and CBD are processed through some of the drug metabolism pathways that other drugs are metabolized in. So all the you know P450s and the different SIP pathways, they can be impacted by THC and CBD. So particularly with CBD, we see it interacting with Coumadin or Warfarin. So if you're on any type of a blood thinner, it's really important to talk to your healthcare team, including your pharmacist, to make sure there isn't going to be a negative interaction. If you're using any kind of sedating medication like barbiturates, 
are benzos. Again, it's important to have that conversation to make sure that you're not having uh, adverse effects from combining those two types of, of substances. And obviously, if you're using something like alcohol, uh, you need to be aware that if you're using a high THC cannabis, that you may see an exacerbation of, you know, feeling high, feeling discoordinated, being at risk of falls. So just being aware of how you're combining your substances. And, and for those of you that, you know, are younger or those that may have, uh, you know, grandkids or, or, or children that are get, thinking about getting pregnant, there's been a little bit of a belief among some um, individuals that I can't use medication during pregnancy, but maybe I can use cannabis to help with things like morning sickness. And there's actually a, a fair amount of concern that in using cannabis during pregnancy, we do see uh, early uh, um, labor as a consequence. We're starting to see some impact on fetal growth because the endocannabinoid system seems to be uh, integral to how our brains develop and how our nervous system develops. Uh, and we're starting to really unpack uh, what the long-term consequences are in terms of consuming cannabis during pregnancy, consuming cannabis while breastfeeding, and whether it's going to negatively impact uh, children going forward. Um, and then lastly, I've already mentioned this, but if you're using cannabis that's from an unregulated source, uh, from the illegal market, you always have to be concerned whether it's contaminated with other substances, whether it's been treated properly, and whether it's free of things like bacteria and fungi, which can cause other health problems. You know, there's been a lot of kind of um, urban myths that cannabis can be contaminated with things like fentanyl. We haven't seen any documented cases of that in Canada, but exposure to other uh, controlled substances is always something you need to be concerned about if you're moving uh, towards the illegal, illegal market. <clears throat> you know, cognitive health, this has been a really interesting one. We obviously know that THC, you know, can cause you to feel high, um, but we also know that it can have some negative effects. So, you know, you have difficulties concentrating, making decisions, and it has been shown to impact short-term memory. Uh, and the greatest effects on cognitive health uh, and the ability to process information has been really seen in people that are using it every day in large amounts, and also for people that are using it very young, starting to use it before their age of, of 16 years. Uh, and we do know that with the brain development, that our brains continue to develop until the age of 25. And because of the role of the endocannabinoid system in that brain development, there's been some real concerns about people using cannabis before that age. However, we're just starting to get the studies coming out, the fMRI studies, where they're actually scanning and visually looking at the brain and looking at people that are using cannabis regularly, those that use it very infrequently, and those who don't use it at all. And currently what we're seeing is that up to the age of 16 and up, there doesn't seem to be a lot of impact and difference across the amount of cannabis that's being used. We need to start doing those studies with the younger population. And obviously there's a ton of ethics around that. So that has not happened at this stage, but we really do need to kind of unpack how dangerous is cannabis use for which age groups and how do we best protect them. And what's interesting is that we do have some large scale studies that are starting to come out. This one was a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that have been looking at the use of cannabis and how it's impacting adolescents and young adults related to their, um, their cognitive functioning. Uh, and what's interesting is the study really showed that in these younger individuals, when they used cannabis, there was definitely some negative effects in terms of their cognition, but a lot of that disappeared when they stopped using it for at least three days. So perhaps these effects that have generated a lot of concern are very short term, or maybe they're only short term for this this group of individuals, but they may be more long-term for younger individuals. And this is where we definitely need a lot more research so that we're better able uh, to, to talk to these different groups and make sure that we're providing good public health to them. Now, in terms of mental health, as I mentioned, a lot of people use cannabis to manage some of their mental health concerns. We do see though that when people are using high THC strains, they end up with a lot of psychosis and panic attacks. And I've personally have witnessed this among my social network. We also know that high THC strains, they don't necessarily cause schizophrenia, but for people that have a family history of schizophrenia are likely to develop it. We see it developing much earlier than we would expect. So it may actually kind of just increase the timeline around schizophrenia. 
There's also a moderate link to depression disorders uh, in terms of people have increased uh, ideation around suicide and also increased attempts. So it's a bit concerning that people may be using cannabis to address their depression, but it may actually be making it worse in some individuals. We don't see a lot talking about anxiety disorders um, beyond that in terms of social anxiety, cannabis may actually uh, increase the risk of, of that. Although if you look at using high CBD strains, it actually seems to improve uh, social anxiety. And I'm gonna get into that uh, a little bit further um, in our presentation today. And then lastly, around public health or mental health, uh, I do want to have this kind of, you know, this is the elephant in the room around cannabis is this notion of addiction. And that's not a language that I've used because it doesn't have the same hallmarks as other types of, of addictions, particularly related to opioids. But we definitely do see about one in 10 people ending up with a dependency on using cannabis. Uh, and when they stop using it, they will see some uh, minor withdrawal symptoms around being anxious, trouble sleeping and concentrating. Um, but it's not as long term and as severe as we see around an opioid uh, withdrawal. Um, but this is still an issue and this can have a lot of negative impacts on people's lives going forward. Uh, and obviously, if you use very high THC strains, you may have severe intoxication to the point that you may need to seek um, medical care. But just to put it into context, and I, I love this study, it was done in Scotland where they talked to a, a full range of people working in addiction uh, medicine, and they asked them to rate the harms posed by different substances. And you'll see that cannabis is at the very right-hand side of that graph as having the lowest uh, harm to self score, whereas something like alcohol is actually fourth from the top in terms of potential harm. So I think it's always important that we put cannabis in this type of context. I also think it's important to recognize that for those people that are struggling around using cannabis, that there are some great resources around harm reduction about how to use cannabis safe. And one of them that I would really recommend is the Canada's Lower Risk Cannabis Use Guidelines, which is really a common sense approach to using cannabis in a way that's going to limit its risk, particularly around addiction and around, uh, around dependency and harm. So now just to kind of flip a little bit, I want to actually dive into some of the uh, beliefs and some of the, the evidence around uh, medical cannabis. And I'm really just going to focus on kind of five, I believe, uh, main areas that I felt would be really relevant uh, to the group that's joining us today. Um, and again, these are just some of the beliefs that I've heard over the years that, you know, cannabis isn't a medicine, you know, it shouldn't be used by older adults. Um, but then I've also heard people tell me, you know, I find it really helps me have a good sleep um, or I find it's better than any of my other medications uh, in treating my chronic pain. And with that segue, let's actually jump into talking about cannabis and pain. And, you know, we've had numerous studies over the years, starting back in the 1950s and 60s, where they were particularly looking at some of the pharmaceutical forms of cannabis. So things like Nabilone or Marinol uh, and really looking at the role of THC in the management of pain. Uh, more recently, we've seen a lot more research that's focused on plant-based cannabis. So I have Nabiximols, which is actually an oral spray, which is half THC and half CBD. Uh, and these studies have actually found that cannabis has a role in improving chronic pain. And when you compare it to not using anything, using a placebo, uh, it seems to improve chronic pain management by about 40%. And this is across a whole host of, of different pain conditions like osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis related pain, et cetera. However, we haven't done a lot of studies at this time to really understand, you know, which cannabis products are most effective. So should you smoke it? Should you use an oil? Should you vaporize it? What is the specific dose of THC CBD that's most effective? Uh, and then as I mentioned, what, what's the route that would be most effective? So we need to have a lot more study that's based on these plant-based cannabis products. Uh, and I think we really need to be thinking about using cannabis for pain in the context of the other pain medications that we already have studies on. And you know, the biggest issue is where do we place cannabis in relation to using opioids? And right now we've seen cannabis kind of move down that hierarchy. So, um, you know, it's not the last resort anymore, but we're starting to still see opioids being chosen before we see cannabis. And I know that some of my colleagues in the pain community have started to question about whether we should be moving cannabis before opioids 
particularly because of our epidemic, uh, so that we can, you know, leave opioids as more of a last resort. You know, the other thing I think we need to explore more is cannabis and its impact on the immune system, as well as potentially anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, is it going to have a real role in things like rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, and we're really, you know, just in the past five months, we've seen research teams being awarded millions of dollars to explore the role of cannabis in the treatment of things like rheumatoid arthritis. So it's going to probably take us another four to five years to start seeing those results to really understand whether it will have benefit. But at this time, the general understanding is that for some individuals, cannabis does have a role in managing pain. The other one I wanted to touch on is sleep issues. And this is a lot of anecdotal information suggests that people find it helpful uh, if they're dealing with insomnia or they're having trouble staying asleep. And there's actually fairly good uh, evidence from a variety of different trials looking at improving short-term sleep outcomes around people that have things like sleep apnea where they're stopping uh, you know, breathing uh, during their sleep, you know, people that are struggling with chronic pain and it's impacting their sleep issues. Um, but we don't have a lot of trials that have specifically considered cannabis and sleep disorders. So we actually need to start seeing those trials that are specific to sleep apnea or are specific to sleep, sleep latency issues. Uh, most of the studies to date have focused on the dibiximols, which are quite expensive. So again, we need to see more research on the plant-based ones. But this is really a case of where people may be saying, I'm going to do a harm reduction uh, approach and use cannabis instead of using a sleep medication which may have an addictive property to it. But again, this is something where having a conversation with your physician or nurse practitioner uh, would be a, a good idea. So just talking a little bit more about anxiety, there's definitely been growing interest in the role of cannabis, particularly CBD, in managing anxiety disorders. But we don't have a ton of trials at this time. Most of the trials to date have been really focused on psychology students at universities that have social phobias related to speaking in public. Uh, some of the small, small trials, like we're talking 24 people, have found that it may be helpful to use CBD. But CBD in a large amount, 600 milligrams, whereas, you know, when you look at how much is in some of the products that are publicly available, they could have 10 milligrams. So this is using a large amount of CBD, which may have some, some negative health effects. We've also seen uh, using it in specific uh, patient populations like for Parkinson's disease. And again, they have found it to be effective, but in a very small population. Um, and what's really fascinating to me, and these studies again are underway uh, in Canada, is looking about whether uh, cannabis can have a role in treating PTSD symptoms. So I have several colleagues that are focusing on the Canadian veteran population and seeing if PTSD symptoms can be improved. And some of the beginning evidence suggests it helps with things like night terrors uh, and helping people sleep. Uh, but we need larger trials in this population to understand uh, whether it's truly effective and whether it helps uh, in the long term. Now, one area that I'm uh, really fascinated by uh, is whether it may have a role in dementia. Uh, and again, limited research again, but we're starting to see more and more studies that are interested in whether cannabis can help with a lot of the neuropsychiatric symptoms that people living with dementia or Alzheimer's may experience. So that's such things as being aggressive, having irritability, delusions, or having a lot of agitation, particularly uh, at sundown or during the nighttime. Most of these trials haven't been well designed, but some of the preliminary studies are suggesting that there is a, a decrease in some of these symptoms. However, there was a, a study with 50 patients that was done, and they didn't find that it improved those symptoms, but it did seem to be kind of well tolerated. We didn't end up seeing people having increased falls, for example, in using cannabis. But that's always something that, you know, cannabis, high THC can impact your motor coordination. So if you're using this in a population that's at high risk of falls, you need to be aware of that. One of the criticism of the dementia and Alzheimer's studies focusing on cannabis right now is that the dose of the THC um, may be too little uh, and that we need to be considering uh, not just THC, but also CBD. 
Uh, and we're really at the beginning stages of this type of research. And I actually was very fortunate to just get funded by Riverview Health Center uh, to look at the role of cannabis in long-term care. And I'm really hoping that that study is just going to provide a foundation uh, for hopefully future trials uh, around uh, cannabis uh, in long-term care uh, treatment. And then the, uh, the last kind of condition I want to touch on is Parkinson's disease. And I was very fortunate to go and speak to uh, Parkinson uh, uh, Disease Foundation of Canada uh, last year in Montreal. And really starting to hear some of the beginning evidence that's coming out regarding whether it can help with some of the uh, muscle spasms, coordination issues, as well as some of the... Um, the mental health issues that come alongside Parkinson's disease. There has been some beginning trials that suggest that cannabis, particularly using an extract from the plant, uh, is well tolerated. Um, but we have mixed results in terms of whether it actually helps uh, with motor uh, and other kind of general symptoms of, of um, Parkinson's, whether it can protect and reduce the you know, exacerbation of, of Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, but overall, people uh, in the latter study where they focused on CBD actually found improved quality of life uh, and improved overall well-being, which may mean that it's addressing some of the anxiety uh, that Parkinson patients uh, may be experiencing alongside um, their, their condition. What's really fascinating, I, I put up the Balash study here from 2017, is that we have these you know, clinical trials that often are saying, you know, we're not seeing a lot of effects or there are minor effects around cannabis. But when you talk to people within the community, they're telling us that they're finding improvements. And in Parkinson's, it's around pain and depression and sleep and stiffness. And so this really goes back to us talking to patients and family members and understanding what they're using in terms of cannabis and what are the outcomes that they're finding from that and then having that information inform the trials so that we're making sure that we're using the right type of cannabis and the right dose and really being driven by what's happening at the bedside and then going back and doing uh, the proper trials around it which is obviously very different than most drug trials and how they're conducted. So as we're moving along here, I just want to kind of touch on some of the other benefits that I'm happy to take questions on. We don't have uh, a lot of time to go into all of them. But we obviously know that cannabis has a role around things like preventing seizures. And in fact, the FDA in the United States uh, just last year approved Epidiolex, uh, which is a CBD-focused uh, drug in treating uh, severe epilepsy syndromes like Gervais in children. Um, there's also a lot of interest in using it in the management of cancer and cancer-related symptoms, so things like nausea and vomiting and cancer-related pain. The evidence is a bit mixed. What's been a really fascinating field around cancer is does cannabis have a role in the treatment of cancer? And we're very much at early stages where the only trials that have been conducted with humans is in the context of brain cancer, glioblastoma. Uh, we have a lot of mouse models and cellular research that suggests that many of the cannabinoids have an anti-cancer effect, but does that translate when it's consumed uh, in the human body? So a lot of work to do on many of these conditions. And I'm sure as we unpack the endocannabinoid system, we will may find other potential uh, avenues of cannabis as a medicine. So in our last 10 minutes, I really wanted to just quickly touch on some of the regulations. Um, how do you access medical cannabis in this country? Uh, and then talk about some of the, the regulations that are here uh, in Manitoba. And again, there's some facts and fictions around this in terms of, you know, where can I use cannabis? I can take it across the border if I'm using it, you know, for medical purposes and I have an authorization. You know, I, I like using cannabis because I can then drive home after I'm at a, at a party. And so let's kind of talk about some of these, uh, these beliefs. So just to put some context around it, uh, the Cannabis Act. So this is the uh, the regulations, the legislation that came out in 2018. Just a bit of background, I was very fortunate to present to the House of Commons uh, and the Senate committees around this. You know, the aim of this regulation was really to reduce the illegal market uh, and any of the associated harms with Canadians interacting with the illegal market. You know, nonetheless, you know, not the least is, is, is being exposed to criminal elements, being exposed to an unregulated supply. It also was hoped that by controlling cannabis production in this country and access to it, that we would limit use by youth who were most concerned about in terms of the negative long-term effects. 
So at a federal level, you must be 18 or older to use cannabis. You have to purchase it from a licensed producer or you're allowed to grow a very limited amount at home for plants of a certain height. Um, and in public, you can only have 30 grams of legal dry cannabis or equivalent if you're using something like a, an oil. Uh, and there's really stiff penalties if you're engaging uh, youth or children uh, in any ways with the cannabis market. Now, we have a little bit of a quilt, a patchwork quilt in Canada in terms of our regulations. So while we have this federal bill, we have all these separate regulations across the different provinces and territories. So here in Manitoba, we actually raised the age to 19 years uh, and that you're not allowed to grow cannabis in your home unless you have a medical authorization to do so. Um, and you have to purchase it either through a retail store, a storefront or online, uh, which will then send it to your home uh, by a courier. Now, if you look at the regulations, that are specific to medical cannabis within the Cannabis Act, you can get authorization either from a physician and in most parts of the country from a nurse practitioner. You can grow it at home or you could designate someone to grow. So for example, if you're in an apartment and you don't have the space to grow it, you can designate someone to grow for you or you can get it from a licensed producer. Uh, and you're allowed to have a 30 day supply. So, uh, and that's up to uh, 150 grams of dried cannabis. And as most people in Canada order around two point five grams. Uh, this is a very generous amount that you can have uh, in public. Uh, and you can order it uh, through an online store uh, or you can purchase it from a storefront. However, the storefronts are recreational only. And so if you're trying to claim that purchase on third party health insurance, that often won't be covered. And so your best bet is to go through the actual online stores with your authorization form. So in terms of how you specifically access medical cannabis, you know, as I mentioned, you have to talk to a doctor or a nurse practitioner and you have to get a medical authorization form completed. You then register online with a licensed producer specifying, um, you know, having your medical document in hand. And you also will have a registration form that will specify the licensed producer as well as should have some direction in terms of the type of cannabis you want in terms of the species, the amount of THC CBD, um, whether you're going to have dried cannabis, you're going to have an oil, uh, and then it often will be delivered through uh, mail order or through Canada Post. You know, not all um, physicians and nurse practitioners are comfortable in trying to figure out the amount um, and the type of strain that you're using. And sometimes that's a dialogue that happens between the patient and the health professional. And sometimes the patient is kind of driving that boat a little bit more than the, the health professional. And that really points to the need for us to have more evidence that is getting to our health professionals and to our patient communities uh, so that we have a really informed conversation about that. Uh, one of the big changes around the Cannabis Act before you had to register with one licensed producer and if you wanted to change that producer, you had to go through the whole process again, is that you're able to more easily transfer it to a new licensed producer, an LP, um, or you can split it. So if you like your dry product from one licensed producer, but their oils are better somewhere else, you can actually split that dose. <coughs> Excuse me, almost made it through. <coughs> um, just a little bit of an extra bit of information. Sorry, I'm just. <coughs> Sorry about that. So I get a lot of questions about Manitoba <clears throat> and where you can consume it if you're doing medical. Sorry. <coughs> <clears throat> so in Manitoba, you can only use medical cannabis in a private residence. Um, and that includes your backyard. <clears throat> the problem is, is that many of our Manitobans don't live in a private residence. They live in a rental um, property. <clears throat> so you do need to have a conversation with your landlord about whether that is acceptable or not. And that's why many people choose not to use dry product and smoke it or vape it so that they can use it in an oral form, a tincture form that is less visible and less disruptive to other people that may be living in your, in your building. 
It's really important that you do understand that there's a lot of um, restrictions around outdoor public spaces and where you can use uh, medical cannabis. And it's a lot of common sense in the sense that you're not supposed to use it where other people um, are present. So around restaurants or on patios, you know, where there are children, so in playgrounds, in water parks, public beaches, bus shacks. So there's a lot of restrictions and it's important that you understand them so that you're not putting yourself in the way of, of law enforcement. And again, it's about maybe thinking a little bit about <clears throat> where you use what type of products especially if you're wanting to or needing to use them in public. And that's why we see a growing uh, number of people using medical cannabis are doing so through um, oral routes, using oils and tinctures, uh, because it is more discreet and less noticeable. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, just, I've talked a lot about this already. I don't think I need to get into a lot of different details. It's important that if you go to a storefront or if you're going online that you are aware that there's a lot of different products out there. Concentrates are not legal. Uh, if you're seeing them on a website, that is not a legal source of cannabis in Canada. Edibles just came online uh, in the past few months, uh, you know, mainly in things like chocolates. We haven't seen a lot of beverages come out yet. Um, and it's also important to realize that if you're making choices around cannabis, that there's different amounts of THC and CBD in the product that you're getting. And we always recommend that people start low and slowly go up. <clears throat> so using a low THC strain might be great if you're using cannabis for the very first time. We also think it's important you consider the ratio. There has been some research to suggest that CBD may help mitigate the high that people feel associated with THC. And so a general recommendation <clears throat> within the clinical field has been that people use a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you're going to use 2.5 milligrams of THC, you use a 2.5 milligram of CBD attached to. <clears throat> so it's that one-to-one -one ratio. <coughs> you probably, if you've been onto the storefronts, you'll see that there's a lot of different strains out there. To be honest, you know, they talk about indica, sativa, or a combination, a hybrid. <clears throat> There's not a lot of great evidence in terms of those being different. And in fact, with all of the different breeding that's gone on, we often find that there's no pure indicas or sativas that actually exist. That being said, <clears throat> they often differ in terms of their terpene profile. Those are those things that give it that characteristic smell. Uh, and it may be a little bit like wine, where some people uh, enjoy certain wines have differently, uh, and there may be some minor difference in terms of side effects. And so that really is where consumers kind of have their choice in terms of the different types of strains that are out there. Um, we really need to do more research on understanding, is there significant differences between these strains? Um, are some better than others? Uh, but I think it's gonna take some time for that uh, to actually unfold. So in terms of the different routes, I just wanna quickly touch on the fact that there are differences in terms of how you consume it. So if you are smoking it uh, through a pipe or through a cigarette, you will feel the effects right away, usually within five minutes. And those effects last between two to four hours. And it will vary across um, individuals. Vaping has become very popular, particularly with more and more people using e-cigarettes. And that's where you can heat either oils or dry products uh, within a, 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 an e-cigarette or a vaporizer where it heats that product very quickly. There's been some thought uh, earlier on that this was a safer route of consuming it through an inhaled route because you don't get the particulates you get from smoking. However, we've seen some real concerns, particularly related to using the oils, uh, particularly in the United States, where we've seen real severe lung damage. Uh, and so there is some caution being put out there now that maybe vaping and using oils is not that safe uh, and that we need to do more research on it. It has the same effects though as if you were doing it smoked. And then lastly, the oral. So using an oil or using an edible or using one of the mouth sprays, it takes a lot longer to feel that effect, up to 60 minutes. And so we have seen people overdosing and taking way too much cannabis because they will take a bite of something and won't feel something in five minutes and then they'll consume a larger portion of it. So it's really important that you take your time and wait uh, between uh, consuming uh, cannabis in this route 
and see what the effect is before you would take uh, more. The other important thing is that how it's metabolized in our body can take up to 12 hours. So that's really important to consider using oral cannabis products at nighttime or during a time when you know you won't have any activities for at least half a day. You know, dosing, I mentioned earlier, this is where we need to do a lot more research. And it's important to recognize that it's going to really vary across individuals. If you're naive and have never used cannabis before, naive as in using cannabis, um, and you haven't had any experience using it, you may have more reaction with a, literal, a smaller amount. Um, also, depending on uh, your health condition, uh, depending on the potency of the cannabis, um, you may, again may have different effects. So that's where it's gonna be really important to work with a health professional that's skilled in cannabis medicine to help you in terms of titrating up. And we do talk about this start low, go slow, and slowly work your way up. And in most of the clinical trials, we'll stop, start with usually a therapeutic minimal dose of 2.5 milligrams of something like THC. And then every three, two to three days, we see a slow increase, uh, usually with an upper cap, depending on the health condition. And that's something, again, you can work with your health professional uh, to do. Uh, and I just wanna have a quick note that in a healthcare settings across the country, uh, healthcare professionals are allowed to possess cannabis and assist someone in taking it. And that includes in long-term care, in hospitals, as well as when a home care is being provided in someone's uh, private home. Um, and it's really important to understand that most nurses uh, now have regulations that allow them to support someone in using cannabis, or they can directly uh, uh, provide cannabis to someone, for example, if you're a quadriplegic and you need assistance in actually consuming cannabis. So uh, the regulatory barriers to using cannabis don't exist, um, but there is still, I find, variation across uh, healthcare settings in Canada in terms of whether they actually allow cannabis to be used by their clients uh, or not. Uh, and just as a quick little uh, conversation around using cannabis and driving. I still hear some people think that it's okay to, to consume cannabis and drive. Um, there are some very serious penalties. They're doubled in Manitoba uh, if you are found to be impaired and, uh, um, and driving. Um, we have an immediate roadside suspension in, in uh, Manitoba if you're suspected of being impaired. Uh, and if you fail your drug screening, uh, you will actually lose your license for even longer and have significant impact on your license. Um, and, you know, it's important to know that the studies that have been done does suggest that it reduces your concentration, it slows your reaction, uh, and it can cause you to go up and down in terms of your speed. That being said, we haven't done this research on people that are using medical cannabis and maybe using minimal dosages. Uh, so there's a lot of research that's needed on what is impairment, how much can people consume, and how do we actually detect impairment? So this is not as cut and dry, but obviously for public safety, we advise that most people avoid consuming cannabis and driving if possible. So just to kind of wrap up, I just wanted to let you know that there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, I've put some that are from Health Canada and from the Government of Canada that's around recreational as well as medical cannabis. Uh, the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, which I'm Deputy Director of. Uh, we actually have all of our conference presentations are available online through our educational platform. Uh, and then lastly, in the US, the National Council for Aging Care has actually put on a, a guideline uh, for seniors. And so just to kind of wrap up, and hopefully this is the only pun in my presentation, uh, is that medical and non-medical cannabis is a growing health and social issue in Canada. And I think we're still trying to uncover and, and understand what the impact of legalization will be uh, in the long term. Uh, as my little picture shows, it is a social experiment. It's probably the greatest social experiment that we've uh, done in the last 20 years. So it'll be intriguing to see what the research shows in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. You know, there are going to be challenges, but I'm also hoping there's gonna be a lot of opportunities, particularly in the realm of medical cannabis and whether this can be used as an adjunct treatment alongside the other treatments that we have, or will we find some unique uses uh, for cannabis as a therapy?
Um, we also, you know, as I've mentioned throughout this, if you're thinking about using cannabis, if you're using it even recreationally, make sure you're telling your healthcare provider. It is now a, a, a legal health behavior. Uh, and make sure that if you're having concerns about your use of someone that you know that you are reaching out to the healthcare professionals uh, around this. You know, and cannabis is not for everyone. There are some individuals where it is a substance that could cause a great deal of harm and negatively impact your well being. Uh, and as I've mentioned, you know, our research is really at the beginning. It's been very difficult to do research on what is an illegal substance and is still considered an illegal substance south of the border. Uh, and so while these regulations are changing, it's been very difficult for researchers to gain access to cannabis and to actually conduct the trials. You know, most recently it was up to a year to get a research license to do a study on cannabis. Um, and so as those barriers, uh, you know, get knocked down, we will see this evidence rapidly changing. So make sure you're staying current and you're going back to the literature, you're going back to your healthcare team to see if there's any new evidence uh, around using cannabis. So that's it for me. Uh, I've heard that the slides will be made available. Uh, I do have some references at the end. Uh, that I encourage you to look at, uh, including uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, which had did a, a wonderful summary of the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. And so for those of you that want to know about the studies uh, and the level of research that's out there, this is a wonderful resource that is publicly uh, available. Uh, and I have my email there. So if there are some specific questions that I can address, I'm always happy uh, to welcome them. Thank you so much, Dr. Belneves. Um, really fascinating presentation. We have lots of questions. Okay. Um, we'll try to get through them all. Okay. Um, okay. So the first one, uh, does THC have any harmful effects on the liver? That's a good question. And it's one I probably need to do a little bit more research on. Um, you know, I think there's always been a concern that if you have any um, kind of organ issues. So if your liver is not well functioning, it's always important uh, to talk to your doctor or your pharmacist in terms of whether there's any concern. Uh, when wow. I was looking up some stuff yesterday, um, I saw more concerns about using high dose CBD and its impact uh, on the liver. So if you're using large dosages of either THC or CBD, it's worthwhile talking to your healthcare team to make sure that there isn't uh, any negative impact. If you have any issues around your liver function, you have to recognize that it may not process cannabis the same way for another individual. Uh, and so you could see some of the side effects of cannabis being more pronounced because you're not clearing it from your, your body as quickly. Uh, so, um, consult would be the, the best advice there. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question with a sort of a few follow-up points to it is, ha has there been reputable or peer-reviewed studies looking at the efficacy of medical cannabis products versus a place placebo effect to treat chronic pain? And there's um, a few points just in terms of follow-up in terms of some longitudinal studies conducted by Dr. Peter Fried, um, I think his last name is at Carleton University, who's done some longitudinal studies on children whose mothers were regular cannabis users during pregnancy, um, as well as regular use of cannabis through their youth, including effects on educational accomplishments. So anyway, if you wanted to com comment on any of that. Yeah, so um, I'll be honest, I don't know Peter's work um, well. I know that there's been several uh, teams, and I think Peter's team was just funded through the CITR Cannabis Team Grant uh, to continue doing that work. Uh, there's a team here in Manitoba with the Breast Milk Bank that's also been looking at exploring the long-term impact uh, on um, kids, uh, particularly as they hit uh, school age in terms of their school performance. Um, to me, that research is really at the beginning stages. I'd have to dive into to, to Dr. Freed's work a little bit more to see what the findings were. Um, but I think we are concerned uh, because of the role of the endocannabinoid system in brain development that when it's uh, kids are exposed in utero, when they're exposed uh, in early ages to cannabis, particularly through breast milk, uh, that it may reduce. And I know some of the beginning studies suggest that they may have uh, slightly lower school performance uh, due to that exposure. But again, we need to really tease out how much exposure, what type of exposure uh, to really uh, 
unpack those effects. Uh, and sorry, what was the, the first question was around, um, oh, comparing, uh, comparing uh, cannabis to uh, placebo. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, there's been so many different studies done, be it pharmaceutical forms of cannabis compared to um, placebo. It's very hard uh, to use a placebo uh, in cannabis, particularly if you're focusing on THC, um, because most people, uh, given 25% of our population has used cannabis, um, it's pretty easy to know if you're consuming cannabis or if you're consuming a fake herbal pill, because um, you're not feeling any of the effects of cannabis. So I think there's been attempts uh, I know that there's a study going on right now at BC Cancer uh, Agency that's focusing on uh, the use of it by cancer patients for pain. Uh, they have had the licensed producer that's partnering with them create a herbal placebo pill. Um, that study is underway right now. So I think I, from my recollection, most of the studies have either compared it to um, standard care, which usually means the pharmaceutical that they're using, and then cannabis is used on top of it. We haven't seen a ton of studies where they've actually created a placebo of cannabis and then seen if there was a difference or whether this was just a placebo effect uh, in those studies. So hopefully the study that's being conducted by Pippa Holly uh, in BC might uh, shed some light on that. Mm -hmm. mm, very interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, are there any studies around cannabis as a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder? Yeah, so as mentioned, um, we have, uh, we've had a couple studies in Canada, the Canadian military actually, um, I believe just had a funding competition that was specific to using cannabis in PTSD. Uh, my colleague Zach Walsh at UBC Okanagan uh, has had that as a specific research focus for the last couple of years. Um, that study is that research is still ongoing right now. I know there's been a couple of smaller studies that have suggested basically based on veterans experiences that cannabis does seem to help particularly related to the night terrors so having those very traumatic um, nightmares that wake you up and make you unable to fall back to sleep it, we also see improvement in their overall quality of life and well-being um, I think they're really just trying to understand now whether it also helps with some of the anxiety and the depression that's attached to it as well. Um, and again, hopefully um, through Zach's work and this research program that was funded by the Canadian military, we'll be able to get more conclusive findings around that. And it's not just for military. We really need to expand that to look at first responders as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You may have... Um mentioned uh, this as well, a little bit of this on this next question, but does the use of cannabis have an effect on glaucoma and does it have an effect on Parkinson's? Yeah, so I, I think I covered uh, Parkinson's. I think the jury's mm -hmm. still out. You know, glaucoma has been interesting because it, it was kind of the first um, uh, health condition in which we actually felt cannabis could have a role. And I think, you know, the literature and the research has really advanced to the point that we're, we actually are saying that it doesn't have as much of a role. In fact, that it seems to have a very short term impact on intraocular pressure attached to uh, glaucoma. Um, but then that effect doesn't seem to be long term. And in fact, um, the concern has been that people are using it uh, and then having only short-term effects, which could end up meaning that they're gonna have even more long-term damage. And so the current clinical understanding is that uh, the medications that we have for glaucoma are much more effective long-term than trying to use something like cannabis. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is there, any way, is there any way to measure motivation changes in long-term cannabis users? <coughs> So this is an area I've dived into uh, to a great extent because um, that's more around the realm of using it recreationally. Um, I know that there, I've seen a few studies, particularly looking at psychology students, looking at uh, youth and children uh, that use cannabis, that there have been some studies that have attempted to, um, to look at motivation and shifts in motivation. Um, I know that if you look at the National Academy's uh, summary of cannabis use, particularly in young children, that they do feel that the evidence supports that there is a reduction in motivation, particularly around school performance, uh, as well as things such as seeking um, career uh, choices, getting jobs and things like that. I can't talk about specifics in terms of how they've actually motivated um, or how they've measured motivation. But I think I think a lot of it's been around whether they've um, 
attend class, uh, whether they're completing homework, uh, and whether they're doing other kind of uh, milestones like um, applying for jobs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Super, thank you. Now, the next question is, are there any long-term cogn cognitive deficits from cannabis use? Is this related to the amount used weekly, monthly, occasionally, and is it related to how it is consumed? Yeah, so I think I covered some of this. You know, it's um that that JAMA psychiatry uh, article that was a, a systematic review and meta-analysis kind of threw everybody on, you know, off, off balance a couple of years ago because it was the first one that really looked at not only like what's the effect of using cannabis and yes, it affects cognitive functioning, but they said, well, what happens if people stop using it? And, you know, that study was done in, in youth and young adults, uh, so a very specific age group. Um, but it suggested that when people stop using it for 72 hours, a lot of those cognitive effects disappeared. Um, but what we know is that there's a lot of people 20% that use it every day. And so the concern is that for those that are using it every day, um, and we do know that your cognition gets worse, the more THC you use. So if you're a long-term user that's using it every day and using high amounts, you probably will see a perpetual issue with your cognition, you know, that you will may have, you know, long-term uh, or short-term memory issues. You may have trouble concentrating if you're using large amounts of cannabis every single day, because the results, um, the impact is not getting washed out. You're not saying, okay, I'm using it on the weekend once. And then by Monday, it, it's it's gone because you're using it every day. So that's that's our current understanding. In terms of, of routes, as I've mentioned, um, it's more about how long those effects last. So for something like, uh, inhaled routes, we often see most of the effects disappear, you know, within four hours, that's usually around the acute intoxication. I don't know the research well in terms of how long cognition effects last, if you're using it as a one off inhaled. But we do know that if you're consuming it orally, those short term acute effects are going to last a lot longer. So route is important in terms of how quickly those short term effects are, are um, dissipate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit more to studies regarding to long-term use and mental effects on the brain? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I, that I haven't dived as much again into the long-term, you know, use of, of usually recreational use. And I think, I think it always goes back to one is age of onset. And so most of the people that seem to struggle long-term later in life with key life milestones. Uh, it seems to be associated with early onset abuse. So we're talking before the age of 16. We also seem that the greatest issue, and this is across you know, physical cognition and mental health, is people that are using it every day. Um, and that being said, we know anecdotally that some people say, well, I've used cannabis for 20 years for my anxiety and, and I feel better as a consequence. But in terms of the studies being done, I'm not familiar with that work in terms of, you know, if someone has a mental health issue and they've used it for 20 years, are they better off or not? Um, so that's something that I might have to answer offline uh, and do a little bit more research on. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question is, what is the difference in the efficacy of, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing this well, but na na nabixamols versus nabixamols? Uh, THC oils that are used under the tongue. Yeah, so um, I'll be honest, I, I haven't, we're, we're barely at the stage of just doing a trial on cannabis alone, be it nabixamol or be it THC oil versus whatever, uh, and a pharmaceutical. We barely have any trials out there that are really like nabixamol versus THC versus this. Um, and we do have some, but again, I'm not sure which condition um, this, um, this participant is referring to. I've seen a few studies um, looking at chronic pain, looking at uh, neuropathic pain that has compared nabixamols to THC. I can't remember if it was an oil or if it was, um, you know, something like nabalone. My recollection is that 
particularly for things like neuropathic pain, we're, we're tending to see nabiximols do better than just pure THC. And I think it goes back to the type of condition, whether it has an inflammatory component, an immune component to it, because we really do think that CBD may have a role and that part of the endocannabinoid system around immunomodulating effects, um, around inflammation. And so if there seems to be that component to the health condition uh, they're referring to, then the Bixamols may be better because they have um, the CBD uh, in equal ratio with the THC. You know, THC oils seems to be much more around kind of uh, acute uh, chronic pain, uh, things like headache, um, you know, whereas you know something like a rheumatoid arthritis, nabiximols may be more appropriate. So I don't know if I'm just kind of rambling a bit here. Mm -hmm. The other thing too with THC oil under the tongue, you know, we don't have enough research to understand how that's absorbed. Uh, I talked to some uh, clinician the other day and they're like, you know, they're pro people are probably swallowing 50% of it. So it's not actually getting absorbed into the bloodstream. It's actually doing the second pass. Uh, through the gut. Um, and so it may be slowing down absorption. So I think comparing different routes of administration is still a, a huge um, kind of black hole for us still. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question is, is, is medical cannabis inspected federally and provincially for quality, published strengths, impurities, etc.? Great question. My understanding is that's at the federal level. Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of their resources have been diverted uh, because of COVID-19. Um, so my understanding is that's supposed to be, <coughs> excuse me, at, at the federal level. Um, and, you know, the expectation is that licensed producers are being inspected. Their product is supposed to be uh, being inspected, um, going through laboratory tests. You know, we have identified contaminations. We have identified product that wasn't appropriately labeled. How consistent is that uh, that review? How frequent are inspections? I know from the research side, they have really under-resourced their ability to review applications. There's some concern that that um, that they haven't been sufficiently regulating the supply as well. It's it's better than what it was before, where there was absolutely no regulations that you know people were growing in the illegal market. At least now licensed producers have a very clear set of guidelines in terms of how they're producing product, how it's stored, et cetera, how it's labeled. But <clears throat> there is some concern, particularly when we see um, some licensed producers um, storing their product for significant periods of time. Is there a degradation of the supply? Uh, do we see a reduction? Um, I think we need to do a lot more research and that's hopefully part of a, a study that was just funded actually at the University of Manitoba with uh, Lauren Kelly leading it, uh, that's looking at the use of cannabis among children uh, for medical purposes. Um, they're actually gonna be doing a national study where they'll be getting product from the parents and from the children that are using cannabis. Uh, and they're gonna be looking at the quality and the THC and CBD quantities in that product. So that's going to give us a little sense of from the medical realm how accurate uh, that material is, that product is, and are people actually getting what they're paying for? So, um, you know, it's it's a good system. You know, I think there's still, unfortunately, some holes in it in terms of, of uh, monitoring it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the next question is, how are facilities like Riverview here in Winnipeg mm -hmm. managing the logistics of supporting residents to smoke? Great question. And that's what my, my research study is, is hoping to look at. Um, we literally just got funded uh, a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, with COVID-19, I'm not able to go into the facility. Um, but I am really uh, interested in talking to them, not only about it being used for medical purposes, but also recreational purposes, as this is many people's uh, home. Uh, and so uh, at this time, I can just share from personal experience, because my mother um, was a, a, a resident at Riverview, that um, there was, um, I was uh, informally told that um, I should not ask about cannabis use and whether it was a possibility in that setting. So uh, this study will really hope to talk to all the key stakeholders, including clients and, and family members, administrators, and clinicians to really understand 
what's people's beliefs around cannabis, how is it being used, what are the policies, what are the regulations. So um, I stay tuned for the next uh, 12 months and hopefully I'll be able to publish those, uh, those findings and share them with the community. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to bring you back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, two more questions. Um, does, does one become habituated, therefore needing higher amounts to feel the effect? Does that fade um, with yeah. the break in use? That's, that's a great question. And you know what? From most of the research that I've seen, you know, people need to be often titrated. So many people are like, hey, I'm good at 2.5 milligrams of THC. I don't need to go higher. Some people might have to go up to 7.5. The studies that I've seen, and my main area has been around oncology, around cancer, we have not seen an escalation in dose. If they've seen an escalation in their, their pain, then yes, we may need to increase the amount. But um, from most of the stuff I've seen around pain, people have gotten a very steady state and they haven't really seen that kind of level of tolerance that we see in something like opioids. Um, there's been a few studies I've seen that suggest that there could be a potential for tolerance to develop, but it does not seem to be at the same extent as something like the opioids, which is, again, one of the reasons that people um, in the pain community in particular are quite excited by cannabinoid-based medicines um, to avoid some of the, the concerns they have around opioids. Hmm. Okay. And I think this is a really great last question, um, which is cannabis has been around forever. Why there have been so few applicable studies. Yeah, I, I think I touched on it at the very end. It's been an illegal substance since the 1900s. Um, I have a colleague, uh, Mahmoud, who's down at uh, Mississippi University. Um, he's in charge of their farm. He, he can only grow uh, one type of cannabis product that then has to be stay there for three years before it's distributed. And he only is able to provide it to a handful of studies every year in the United States. So if you think about how large the US is and the amount of budget they have for, um, for research in, in health, and they've only done a handful of studies, a lot of it's because People can't gain access to it. They can't get the product that people are actually using. Um, so despite it being, you know, very predominant in our society, being used for medical purposes for thousands of years, because it was made an illegal substance, researchers have really struggled to gain access to it. Ethics boards have expressed grave concerns about it being used in clinical trials. Um, and we've also experienced a lot of barriers to just institutions being unwilling to support cannabis research. Um, we haven't had a lot of funding programs. It's only in the last you know, two years that we've actually seen specific research programs in Canada that have been specific to cannabis. Even though we've had a program since 2000, we had no research program attached to it. Um, and it was quite um, a biased area. Like I got a lot of, you know, I usually had to go to do a presentation, say I'm not a pothead to start my presentation because people assumed I must use cannabis if I do research on it. So um, I, I think there's just been a lot of stigma, a lot of um, bureaucratic barriers, a lot of legal barriers to doing the research. And even now, waiting 12 months to get a research license when your study is only two years long, is, is a huge barrier. So we hope it's going to get better. Um, but we still have a lot of, of a lot of ways to go. Um, the other thing just as a side point is that trying to do research on a plant based medicine that is a complex substance. That is not a paradigm that most clinical trialists are used to they're used to one component, one product, easily standardized in a lab. It's a little bit more challenging when you have a plant in front of you that has a hundred and some components and you can't guarantee that every batch is going to be identical to the the previous one so um lots of challenges but the good thing is there's a ton of people across this country throughout the world that have all jumped onto the cannabis research bandwagon so i think you can expect in the next 10 years we're going to have some amazing results come forward um and a lot of it will be coming out of the university of manitoba which is which is mm -hmm. awesome which is, yeah, very exciting. You know, one last question came in just as you were talking, if you don't mind, we have just a few minutes left. Um, can you explain how cannabis can be both an appetite suppressant and stimulant? Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a great one. Um, I don't know if I could answer that. You know, I, I think it, a lot of it's going to depend on us unpacking the different components of it. So while 
THCV, you know, really seems to have this suppressant quality and, 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 and reduces your appetite, THC increases it. So, you know, if you have a way of just isolating THCV or you get a strain that's really high on it, it may actually suppress your appetite. Whereas if you're using something that's high in THC, you get what's considered the munchies. Now, that's a really simplified uh, response to that. Um, I, I don't know the data well, but I know that there's a, a lot of researchers in the labs that are really trying to unpack the role of cannabis and the endocannabinoid system on metabolic syndrome. So things like diabetes, its role in obesity, and what part of the endocannabinoid system is, is triggered, which is, you know, um, has an implication in terms of managing obesity. And so I, I think we're still unpacking how cannabis can be used to suppress people's appetite or is it really about suppressing their appetite is it more about trying to change the metabolism of our food and how it's taken up within our bodies so i think there's going to be several different avenues that's going to relate to how cannabis impacts our food consumption and how it impacts um our our, our weight uh, and, and our overall health. So, um, I, I can do a little bit more research on that if that sent as a question, uh, and see if I can give a, a little bit more of a, a grounded answer in terms of how does it seem to have these, these two effects? It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, no, that all, and lots of really great and informed questions. So thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Bolnis, for for that really fascinating presentation, for giving of your time of all the questions, and and thank you to everybody who who's on the line, who's participating, uh, yeah. whether person or whether you're going to to listen to this after the fact. We really appreciate you being part of this and and making the virtual learning for life program part of your day. We will be sending all of you a survey to follow up uh, because we'd like to get your thoughts and feedback. And please do provide your thoughts and feedback as it's really the only way that we're able to improve and continue this type of program. So if you registered for next week, which is on May the 20th, our speaker is Dr. Michael Yellowbird, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Social Work, and he's uh, very new to the University of Manitoba, and he will be speaking on mindfulness meditation. So please, if you haven't registered for that, I encourage you to do so. Everybody have a great week. Please stay, th please stay safe, and thank you so much for participating today. Thank you.